Well, this morning we're going to return to our study of the book of Genesis, which was where we were uh, before the Easter season and before uh, before spring break. And this might feel like a little bit of a down after last week, uh, after last Sunday. We just had the joy of reveling in the glory of the resurrection. And now here we are going all the way back to the fall of man and the curse in Genesis chapter three. And you might think, well, with all the joy we just had focusing on Easter and the resurrection, why go back there this week? Why now? Well, remember one thing that I told you last week, if you were here last Sunday on Easter, one thing that I told you about the Bible. Uh, the Bible is all one story, and it's all pointing us to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, even Genesis chapter 3. In fact, I would say if we don't understand what's happening in Genesis 3, then we probably don't really understand why the resurrection of Jesus Christ matters as much as it does. What happened in this chapter of Scripture, Genesis 3, is so foundational that I think it, it actually explains so much of human behavior throughout the course of history. The reason that that you and I think and feel and, and act the way we do every day is, in most part, explained by the fall of man and the consequences of sin that we read about in Genesis 3. If you want to understand yourself, if you want to understand the people around you and the world that you live in, you need to understand this chapter of the Bible. So back to Genesis chapter 3 we go. Now, I know it's been almost a month since he, since we were here in Genesis, so let me remind you a little bit of, of where we were when we left off. Uh, the last time that we were in Genesis, we talked a little bit about the existence of evil. We talked about the reality of Satan and demons and the sovereignty of God over them. We talked about the lies that Satan used to tempt Eve to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we discussed how both Adam and Eve fell into sin, uh, that sin of desiring to set themselves up as the judge of good and evil, rather than trusting and obeying the judgment of God. And so both of them, Adam and Eve, fell into sin. We're going to pick back up this morning, starting at chapter 3, verse 7. Uh, and as we look at the fallout from this first sin, today we're going to focus on one particular consequence that Adam and Eve had to deal with, and so do each of us at some point in our lives, and that is shame. So let's turn together to, to Genesis chapter 3 and, and see what the Spirit of God has for us this morning in this passage. Would you join with me in standing if you are able to stand? for the reading of God's word. I'll be reading Genesis chapter 3, uh, verses 7 through 24. This is the word of the Lord. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. First is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. 
Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. You join with me in prayer. Father, in these words we read about that first fall into sin and the curse, the curse that came after, the curse that each one of us has lived with all of our lives. Oh Lord, help us as we study your word today, help us to gain a deeper understanding of the effect of sin on our hearts. Show us the ways in which we have tried to cover over our own sin and shame. Please take our weak and wounded hearts and cover us in the love of Jesus Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. So I've got three points on the outline today. Number one, feeling exposed. Number two, the questions of God. And number three, the, number three nakedness covered. So as I, as I mentioned before, we're going to talk about the topic of shame this morning. The passage has some very important things to teach us about the concept of shame. For a long time in our, our Western, individualistic, American culture, shame has, has not really been something that we've wanted to put in the spotlight. It's not really something we want to talk about. Uh, I, I'm not really even talking about our own personal individual shame right now. I'm just talking about the concept of shame in general. We haven't really wanted to acknowledge the, the presence and influence of shame in our lives. But that, that doesn't mean that shame isn't there. In the 1940s, American anthropologist Ruth Benedict wrote a book called The Chrysanthemum in the Sword. And in that book, she compared the Japanese culture of the 1940s with American culture. And it was actually her work that first introduced the idea of shame and honor cultures to our American society. She explained that in Western society, especially in, in more individ, individualistic cultures, people tend to think about and evaluate their actions based on a perceived moral law. Americans would tend to decide to do what to do based on whether an action was considered to be just and lawful and right. They would ask the question, does an action make me guilty or innocent according to the law? But in contrast, Benedict wrote that Eastern culture didn't operate with the same mindset. Instead of asking, does an action make me guilty? Eastern, cul Eastern culture asks, is an action shameful? Does this bring shame or honor? to me and my family. Honor is a higher good in many cultures than obedience to the law. Maybe you've heard about shame and honor cultures before. I, I hope that you have, because I, I think that in many ways, our society is actually becoming more of a shame and honor culture. Now, to be sure, there have, there have always been elements of shame and honor in American culture, but I think the influence of social media has stepped in and accelerated the shame and honor paradigm. In many ways, it's, it's far easier now to publicly shame or to publicly honor uh, anyone who participates in the world of social media. Uh, we don't even have to know someone personally anymore. If uh, all you need is a laptop or a phone to publicly honor or publicly shame someone with an online presence. Uh, if you don't like my sermon today, all you have to do is go out and post a negative review on YouTube or on Google. Of course, I prefer that you didn't do that, but it, it's a free country. Uh, I'm saying this because I think that for many, especially younger people, uh, these days, feeling shamed is becoming a much greater fear than being found guilty. Being honored has become much more important than, than, than doing what we necessarily think is morally right. And, and while these two things may be very different ways of looking at the world, I think that what we find is that Scripture actually speaks to both of them. 
And in particular, as we're going through these first few chapters of Genesis, Scripture has some very important things to say about shame. The first time we hear about shame in the Bible is actually back at the end of Genesis chapter 2. Uh, at the end of Genesis chapter 2 in verse 25, it says, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now, when we read that passage, it, it often gets taught uh, that this is talking about the sexual relationship between a husband and wife. And I do think that it includes that, but I think it's actually much bigger than that. We get a fuller sense of, of the idea of shame when, when we take a look at chapter 3 as well. Um, it, chapter 3 brings up this idea of nakedness again. And the Hebrew word for naked is eram. Uh, it means without clothing or without barrier. If we think about the way that God created Adam and Eve before the fall, we know that there was no reason for there to be any kind of barrier between Adam and Eve and, and between Adam and Eve and God. We know from Genesis 1 that God created male and female in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. They had dignity and value. They had inherent worth. They were considered very good by their creator. He rejoiced over his creation. There was no barrier among them. There was nothing to hide. There were no secrets. There was no reason for any one of them to be anything but delighted by the other's presence. They were naked and they were not ashamed. In the garden before the fall, Adam and Eve experienced something that deep down every human being really wants but rarely experiences. Adam and Eve were known. They were truly known. They were completely understood. There was no pretense among them. They were loved. They were accepted. There were no flaws to ignore. There were no sins to forgive. There were no annoying habits to just put up with. They were truly and completely known and loved. And it was what they had in the garden. But then paradise was lost. When we get to Genesis chapter 3 with the fall into sin, we, we read this at, at verse 7. It says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The, the first consequence of sin, even before God pronounced the curse, was shame. They felt exposed. Now, as we continue to talk about shame, I want to be careful to make a distinction between guilt and shame. We need to recognize there is a difference between the two. Um, guilt is a legal status before the law. A person who breaks the law carries the legal status of guilty, but that's not what shame is. A guilty person might feel shame, but they might not. But a person who's feeling shame isn't necessarily guilty of breaking a law. Well, what is shame? What, what is shame? I'll, I'll define shame this way. Shame is the experience of a devalued humanity that usually leads to broken relationships. I'll say that again. Shame is the experience of a devalued humanity that leads to broken relationships. Uh, Christian counselor, Dr. Diane Langberg uh, says it this way. She says, shame is a crushing burden. It is not just a feeling, though it is profoundly that, but it is the experience of the self as defective, empty, worthless, and trashed. Guilt says that a person has broken a law outside of themselves. Shame says that a person is defective on the inside. In Genesis 3, Adam and Eve were both guilty and full of shame. They had chosen to disobey God's command that they should not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And though they had been told that they would die if they disobeyed God's law, they didn't expect the shame of their action. Before they had only known that blessed state of being an honorable and glorious human being made in the image of God. They had known God and been fully known. They existed in a state of holiness and glory that reflected back the very glory of their creator. But after verse 7, a profound sense of shame came upon them, and they hid. They felt vulnerable 
They felt exposed. They felt as though they were not what they ought to be. They felt defective. Their eyes were opened and they realized that they were naked. Friends, the nature of shame is traumatic. Shame causes us to withdraw. Instead of being open and honest and real before others, instead of being known, it makes us want to hide. Shame makes us want to control information that others might know about us. Uh, we fear letting others into the deepest, darkest places of our lives because we think if they really knew everything about us, then they just might see how defective we are. Shame says to us, the only way that someone will ever really love me is as if they don't know the truth about me. We can't really let people see the truth. It's, it's too defiled. It's too ugly. It's too much to bear. We don't want to feel exposed. And so we hide. Here in America, uh, we sometimes hide our shame behind our individualism. In other cultures, shame is much more obvious. It's, it's much more noticeable. Shame drives actions that, that we might find inconceivable. Uh, Diane Langberg tells a true story of a 17-year-old woman in, in the country of Jordan. Uh, her name is Amal. It was discovered by her family that she was pregnant. She told her family that she had been raped by a man who was a friend of the family. But instead of going to, to court to expose the guilt of the rapist, uh, Imol's family was overcome by a sense of shame. Her sister-in-law sold her gold jewelry to try to, to pay a doctor to perform an abortion, but the doctor refused because abortion is illegal in Jordan. So instead... Amal's father decided to use that money to buy a gun. The next day, the father sent away the rest of the family, and he took the gun, and he shot Amal while she was lying in her bed. Believing her to be dead, he left her there, but she survived to tell the tale. And we wonder, how could a father ever do such a thing? What could drive someone to hurt someone in that way? Well, it's shame. It's game. A member of the, the Jordanian parliament in talking about this explained, when a man's daughter does a wrong, even though the daughter was actually the victim, that man cannot just sit among other men. He will be ostracized by the entire community. They would not even let him drink a cup of coffee in their presence. It didn't matter that she was a 17-year-old victim of someone else's sin. The shame on the family was too much to bear. Shame is the experience of a devalued humanity that leads to broken relationships. Why is it that sometimes military veterans come home from active duty and just can't talk about what they've experienced? They, they're not guilty of any particular sin, but simply being exposed to the, the devaluation of human life is, is enough to scar the human soul. So they had no choice in the matter themselves. They find themselves traumatized simply by seeing what they've seen or experiencing what they've experienced. They had to do things and see things that cannot be unseen or undone. Shame is not simply the feeling that a guilty person has. It's a grieving over the loss of what was once beautiful and good. Shame is a, a despair that pushes us away from meaningful relationships with other people. In their shame... Adam and Eve hid. They didn't want to be naked. You know, it, it had never been a problem before this. I mean, they had always been naked. They were created that way. They had been naked before the presence of God for all of their entire lives before this moment, and it didn't matter before. God created the human anatomy. There was, there was nothing wrong with it. There was no need to cover it. But when sin came into the world, so did shame. And with shame came a limited capacity for Adam and Eve to mirror the glory of God. Yes, they were still in God's image. But instead of that image shining brilliantly from them, sin was dulling its luster. And shame said to them, you're not what you're supposed to be. You're less than human. You're not really showing off the image of God the way you once did. You should probably just go and hide. But as we said a few weeks ago, even though they wanted to run and hide, even though they wanted to cover up their nakedness, God came anyway and pursued them. Adam and Eve tried to hide themselves. They tried to cover themselves with fig leaves, but God knew that whatever 
hovering they tried to make on their own just wasn't going to deal with their shame. You know, people try to do all kinds of things to cover over shame. We do it all the time. Why are first dates or, or job interviews so stressful? Why, why, why do we worry about them? Because we're afraid that someone might see things about us that are wrong and, and, and reject us. We try so hard just in everyday life to put our best foot forward. We want to rest just right. We want to have the right look, wear the right clothes, say the right things. And we're really just trying to cover up a sense of shame. We're afraid of letting people in to see the real thing. Some of us may be very private people. That's not necessarily wrong, but but some of them some of us don't want to invite people over to our house, or if we do, we go over the the entire house with a fine tooth comb. My dear mother, who whom I loved so much, you know, back when I was a kid, she would never let any company into the house unless she had cleaned everything from top to bottom and she had her hair and her makeup perfectly done. Maybe there's other ways that we try to cover over shame. Some of us keep ourselves so busy with plans and activities that, that we don't ever have to stop and really take a look at, at our shame. If we just keep going and going and going, then we, we never really have to stop and deal with the reality of it. We just keep distracting ourselves because the reality is too much to bear. Friends, God did not let Adam and Eve hide in their shame. He didn't leave them to sit in it. He, he didn't let them keep telling themselves that the fig leaves that they found were enough to cover it all. He came to them and did exactly what they needed. He came to them and he made them face the reality of their shame by asking them questions. Now, of course, you know, God didn't ask them questions because he needed information. God, God is omniscient. He knows all things. Uh, there was Adam and Eve couldn't hide anything from him. Hebrews 4.13 says, no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. They couldn't hide from God, but he came and he asked them the questions because he knew what they needed. The way back to a right relationship was not by hiding, and it was not by covering themselves. Friends, each one of us has, has shame that we're dealing with in one way or another. Genesis 3 tells us that the way through shame is not by hiding. Our fig leaves will not do the job. God comes to us and he asks us questions. His spirit asks us, where are you? What have you done? Who told you that you were naked? And asking these questions, when, when God asked Adam and Eve, he, he forced them to identify exactly where the shame is coming from. Of course, he already knew that they ate. They needed to reckon with it. They needed to know that disobeying God brings shame. Friends, shame is an effect of the fall of man. We all deal with shame because we live in a fallen world. We deal with the shame of our own sin, and we deal with the shame that comes from other people's sin. Shame is not, it's not something that we can compartmentalize or control, even though we try to. Our sins may bring shame on those around us, even though they aren't the guilty ones. How often do abuse survivors, even though they're, they're innocent, how often do they have to bear the crushing weight of shame? Friends, I don't know what, what shame may lie in your past. I don't know what, what shame you may bear even today. I don't know what weight you are carrying from either your own sin or the sins of others against you. But please don't shove it down. Please don't cover over it. Lay it bare before the Lord. He asks you, what is it that you've done? What is it that's been done to you? How have you hurt others? How have you been hurt yourself? Who told you that you were naked? Where is your shame coming from? Lay it before the Lord. There is nothing that you can tell him that he doesn't already know. There is nothing that can surprise him. Bring your shame to him. Our God knows what to do with shame. He knows how to handle it, and he is the only one who can truly cover our nakedness. Take a look with me at verse 21. It says, And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skin and clothed them. You know, it would have been just 
for God to end the lives of Adam and Eve in that moment. They knew that the wages of sin is death. They knew the consequence of eating from the tree. They had been told before, and, and that death would come eventually, but it didn't come yet. You know, God also could have cursed Adam and Eve directly. And there was definitely some divine cursing going on here in Genesis chapter 3. But did you notice that God did not specifically curse Adam and Eve themselves? He cursed the serpent. He cursed the ground. He cursed the circumstances under which the man and the woman would live. But he did not curse the man and woman specifically. He went out of his way so as to not curse his beloved children. They were still his chosen image bearers. No, for his children, he would make a covering. An animal would be slain, its blood would be spilled, and its skin would be taken to clothe the nakedness of the man and woman. Friends, we'll talk more about the curse in the coming weeks, but I cannot end today without drawing your attention to Genesis 3.15. As God is cursing the serpent, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The theologians tell us that this verse is the first explicit reference of a savior to come. This verse is called the Proto-Evangelion, the first gospel, the first promise of, of good news to a fallen mankind. Friends, before God says a word to Adam and Eve about how the curse will affect them, he says to the serpent, your days are numbered. There is a war beginning between your children and my children, and though you will strike the heel of my child, he will crush the head of yours. Friends, the wrath of God at sin is directed primarily at the deceiver himself. God hates sin and he hates shame and he has declared war on Satan and his deceivers. He is not at war with Adam and Eve. Instead, he has covered them. He has brought them back into relationship. Friends, our God despises shame. He went to war to destroy it. Hebrews 12, 12, chapter, chapter 12, verse 2 tells us to look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. In order to defeat sin and shame, in order to cover our, our, our nakedness, God would send his own son to bear all our shame. Hebrews 12, 3 says to us, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint hearted. Friends, consider the shame of Jesus. Consider the shame of the one who died to cover our nakedness. I'm going to, to quote Dr. Diane Langberg again because she, she, she talks about the shame of Jesus so poignantly. She says, a baby was born to an unwed mother, shame. He was a child of Nazareth, shame. A man who walked the roads with women, shame. He touched lepers and de demoniacs and he bothered with children, shame. He was sold for the price of a slave. Shame. He was arrested by religious leaders and publicly insulted. Shame. Degraded in front of jeering crowds. Shame. Dragged through the streets. Shame. And set on high for all to see. Naked. Struck. Beard pulled out. He was spit upon and he couldn't even wipe it away himself. Humiliated and put on one of the most shaming and torturous instruments ever in the history of the world. He was shamed by the world that he had made and he became shame. He embodied it without hovering. Everyone could see. He hid not his face from shame. This is the Jesus that the author of Hebrews wants us to see. We are told to look at the shame of Jesus. We don't naturally want to look at shame. We want to hide from it. We want to look away. We want to hide from our own shame. But Jesus tells us, look at my shame. Jesus takes all that is shameful and he says, look at me. Hebrews says he despised shame itself. He wasn't afraid of it. He didn't hide from it. He put it on display. He despised shame. You know what the word despise means? It means to hate, to consider worthless, even to spit at. 
This Jesus, who did not hide his face from shame, actually shamed shame itself. He considered shame to be worthless. He took all the pain that shame had to offer on the cross and said, shame, you have no worth. You have no power. You have no ability to devalue me anymore. At the cross, Jesus Christ shamed shame itself. When we are shamed, we feel our our glory, our value disappear. When Jesus was shamed, he transformed it into glory. He was given a name that is above every name. When we are shamed, we, we try to hide from people. But because Jesus was willing to be shamed for us, we can actually be restored to a right relationship with God. By, by enduring shame in plain sight, he broke the power of shame forever. We can look at, at the shame in our lives now and we can say, you have no hold on me. I belong to Jesus Christ. He bore my shame at Calvary and now his glory is my glory. His father is my father, and I have nothing to hide. Jesus has covered our nakedness by his blood for all eternity. Friends, are you worried that you might be exposed? Are you afraid of feeling worthless? When the Spirit asks you to confess your shame to him, it is not to devalue you, it is to restore you. It is to lift you up. God does not want you to dis- does not want to destroy you. He wants to restore you. He wants you to behold his son, the one who carried our shame, so that we could be clothed in his righteousness forever. Friends, lay your shame at the foot of the cross. Come out of hiding. Let God cover you with his love. Let's pray. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. Lord Jesus, you stared down shame and arose victorious. We praise you for conquering our shame. Help us now, Lord, as we we live with the remnants of shame in our lives, as we live in this world that still endures the curse. Father, give us the grace to come out of hiding. Help us to live honestly before the world around us. Father, help us this week to live in the glory of your grace so that everyone can see what you have done in us. Thanks be to God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our hope is in the Lord. So let's stand and sing hymn number 482. My hope is in her.
Oh, I don't care. Receive the blessing of the Lord from Revelation chapter 1. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.